All right. Lionsgate Films. Uh, this is going to be my commentary for Saw 3D, Saw 7. Thank you for listening uh, to... Yeah, I get movies with love. It's a, it's pretty windy outside tonight. It's really windy. So if you hear wind in the background, uh, yeah, it's windy. So there's going to be a lot I'm going to say about this movie. Most likely is going to be a lot I'm going to say. I actually didn't um, do any notes for this one. I, I don't really have any notes for First All 7, but yeah. Okay, so I will, we're starting off with doing the flashbacks. I just recorded Saw 5 yesterday, so really out of out of order the way I'm recording these. And now we see the blood. Oh, when I saw the blood trail, I knew what it was. I knew who it was. I knew it was our boy. And then we see Lawrence Gordon, which is it's funny because you see the blood ahead of where he's crawling. Which I think is a little funny. Yeah, there's our boy. Kerry Elwes. We've been waiting, like, what, six years? Yeah. Just to see, see what was going to happen. See where our boy was. Yeah, but Gordon, he, um... Yeah, there was a bit of, a, you know, legal issues going on, apparently, in the background. But they had him back in, I think, five. But... Oh, Kevin Grutert directed this one. He directed five, six, and was the editor for, I think, the first four. He was the editor, the image, you know, with the editor with the pictures and all that. But, um, yeah, legal issues, but, oh, yeah, he, I believe they fixed everything, the issues, and saw five. But, you know, they're already done filming it, and there wasn't enough time for Saw 6. You know, they couldn't fit him in there, so they kind of teased him with the box and the door. And then, you know, here he is in 7. External shots of outside in the park. This is a beautiful park. I don't know where this park is, but it it is beautiful. I want to say it's in Toronto. I want to say it's in uh, Canada. Uh, we have our boys Brad and Ryan inside of this glass box, and the and Dina, um, their girlfriend, who cheated on both of them in the top. So in the timeline that this scene actually happened, this actually happened, I believe, around the first movie uh, chronologically. In the crowd, uh, Jigsaw John was actually standing in the crowd in the back, watching the whole time. And apparently in the original script, this was the coming out of, hey, um, Jigsaw is a thing. And this is the first time the public had a taste of who he was and he was revealing himself. Um, This movie, eight was supposed to be the last Saw movie. And so they were filming seven and eight as a two part finale. And... Because the sixth one didn't make enough money, the studio was like, yeah, you guys are done. Wrap it up. So they were filming two different movies at the same time, and they still had their quota, and they had to condense everything. So this movie seems like it was a bit, you know, strange, and that's one of the reasons why. Because this was two different movies put together in one, and the timelines had to be light, had to be, you know, retconned and changed. But yeah, this one happened either before the first movie or, I guess, right after the first movie. So you see, um, yeah, so probably right after the first movie, as soon as Lawrence Gordon uh, crawls out and it goes to this scene, this it was, so it would make sense. When I saw Billy come out on his tricycle, I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be next level Saw movie. This is going to be next level. Um... I could tell because the fact that it was so open and there was an external shots. I remember watching the previews of this movie and I was like, whoa, there's they're outside. Would that that brings a whole new layer to the whole franchise and it being, you know, claustrophobic kind of thing. Uh, 
uh, so yeah, when I saw, when I saw, saw, um, yeah, the external shots, I couldn't wait to see it in theaters and, yeah, when I saw the puppet, I was like, oh, wow, okay, bringing out the puppet, this means that the gloves are off in this one, they're basically able to do whatever they want to, anything that they want to, there's no, we're gonna hold anything back, we're gonna hold off on this, we're going to be a little careful with this. Now, nah, when you see this opening sequence and you see Billy openly come out, that right there, that right there just um, symbolized, hey, I'm a, uh, this is what this, this movie has no, no gloves. The gloves are off on this one. And it's just anything goes. You know, that's what I really admired about this movie was the level of freedom. Um, so yeah, I really, really enjoyed this movie. I actually followed a movie critic on YouTube and I, he always said such positive things about movies, such positive things. And, um, gosh, this, this symbolism is so deep when it comes to these two dudes pushing the saw into each other. And it's, it, it really is a pretty deep symbolism here. It's so real. But anyway, um Oh man, I lost my train of thought. Of course I did. Oh yes, that's that's what I really admired about this movie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had um a YouTuber that I followed and I had to stop following him. No, 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 I'm sorry. He would always say something positive about movies all the time. You know, even if I watched a movie and I didn't like it, and I went to go watch his reviews, he was like, I don't understand why people didn't like this movie. It was great. He was just always just optimistic about so many movies. And it wasn't until he talked about this Saw movie that he said, I did not like this movie. I was like, oh, okay, he does have a movie that he doesn't like. But it just sucks that it was like a Saw movie, you know. He said he hated it. He said it was disappointing to him. He liked all of them. But not this one. Or Jigsaw. Or the other one, Spiral, I believe. Yeah, I remember I watched this movie in 3D. I saw her gut shoot out in 3D. Yeah, once you see all the blood and you saw the gore. That was also another indication, like, oh, yeah, they definitely expect this saw to just bring everything to a close. So I was like, you know, if they're going to end everything, they go ahead and rush it, do what you need to do, end the story. At this point, just have fun and just let the story have fun, let the writers have fun, let, let the characters have their conclusions just let everything just go free. Whatever you didn't want to do in this franchise, just let it happen. And uh, they did. And that's, uh, they, they, really, they really did in this one. Oh, so those two characters, Brad and Ryan, who were holding the two saw uh, blades, the buzz saw or whatever, those two are actually show up at the end of this movie. Um, they show up. Oh, they actually show up a couple of times in this movie. That he, but yeah, like the show up in the middle, or the middle, and at the end. Also, ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, he puts her. There's Hoffman. He gets out of the trap. It was weird because I actually did the commentary for six, and then did the commentary for five, and then did the commentary for seven, or I did two first, and then six, and then five, and now I'm doing seven. I was gonna do seven last. I was thinking about it, but uh, yeah, I just didn't do it. Oh, that's funny. He's in the maintenance closet, and he has. They just showed the sanitizer bottles. <coughs> Strange. I had to actually clean those out today at work. At a work. <coughs> Gosh, my throat's already dry, huh? Today's drink is sweet tea. From a restaurant called Dion's. Apparently, it only is it, it 
apparently it only exists in New Mexico. Right here, when the dude walks in, you see all the Billy puppets. That really shows that there are no more secrets. There's William from Some Saw 6 on the news. Yeah, this really shows. Um, you see all the Billy puppets. That shows that that symbolizes that all the secrets are out. And that there are no more secrets. There is no more claustrophobia. Look at this dude. I like that, how he stitches his own jaw closed. Um, that gives him sort of that, that serial killer Halloween look. Like now that Mark Hoffman has um, the de, de, deformed, or no, uh, wow, I can't think of the word, but detached basically from, um, <laughs> that's funny, it's crazier than a bag of cats, and you see her looking all paranoid, um, but now that, um, that he kind of branched away from, now that Mark Kaufman has branched away from John, um, he's taking on an identity of himself, and him, like, putting that scar around his face is sort of that, that, you know, that mark that, you know, hey, this, this is, uh, him being reborn, and also him, um, yeah, no longer being a part of the whole Jigsaw legacy, but him trying to re, re, configure it within his own in his own mind hmm. I completely forgot about this detective being in here talking to Jill okay I guess I can talk a little bit about um, the movie this movie was filmed in 3D with 3D cameras and the poor producers, this was their last movie, and they were like shooting it in 3D, trying some new things. And they said that they really had a hard time with a lot of shots. Some part, some shots even had to be redone, or they had to, you know, be just uh, changed because of the way that the cameras capture. And the way the cameras like you know interact with light and stuff like that things like that it just wasn't working out properly so you know it, it was just they couldn't do what they wanted to do they were limited to what they could do to the distance to the distance of the cameras and things like that so they were having a really hard time I'm filming this movie with 3D cameras, and they were like, you know, it was a cool thought, an ambitious thought, and a new age thing, but they, ultimately, they, uh, um, they can't, they just didn't want to do it anymore, they just couldn't do it, you can, you can see how some objects and images look kind of weird and fake in this movie, how the lighting seems weird, how it seems like characters are like photoshopped into this movie it seems like certain characters are were like you know digitally enhanced and put into this in this movie and backgrounds look fake it's because of the whole 3d uh, camera effects so it was weird you know we have the cast members the cast members in the back they show them on camera the crew members uh, now that our boy Bobby is uh, talking on camera right now, showing his new book. Being a person who actually has gone through trauma or something terrible, you can like hear how Sean Patrick Flannery's character Bobby describes surviving something so traumatizing and horrible, and it's not, it's not even accurate. And I know it's supposed to be not accurate. You know, when you go through something so horrible, sometimes it's not so much as just, it was bad, and then I found something good on the other side. 
a lot of times when someone has gone through something so traumatizing, you know, a lot of times they have, that when they survive, they have something with them, as Will Smith would say, some kind of key, like, some kind of key to, like, life that, you know, you wouldn't have had otherwise. You can see it, you know, just the way people talk, the way they do, you know. But just as convincing and as, you know, his acting was, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so obviously this was fake and he has the woman there and she's like, hey, you know, why didn't he, what did he do with the big kiss? And I actually watched this scene right before I watched this movie. There was a scene that I was looking for and I ended up forgetting what it was and then the cd was oh i do i want to say that too this cd paused on me i'm watching the movie on dvd right now i don't it just says the final chapter i'm not sure if it's a director's cut if or if there is a director's cut or whatever but um if if it does skip i do apologize because i you know if someone does want to watch this movie and just hear my audio recording while they're watching the movie. You know, there's that. But um, I do apologize if if it does skip. Um, I cleaned the disc off and I went back to the part where it skipped and it didn't skip. So I was like, okay, I guess I fixed it. Anyway, Sean Patrick Flannery. It's funny. I want to say three things. This dude is an actor playing as a bad actor. So like, like I wonder what that was like for him. He seems to play roles that not a lot of people go to, or or a lot not a lot of people see or watch. And he could, he, it's funny seeing all the background cat crew members on camera. It's just like, hey, camera, point that way. Doesn't matter who we catch in the background. <laughs> I remember seeing that in the scary movie, first scary movie, which I don't. I'm not entirely like a hundred and. Ten percent sure that you know those crew members. And here's the the dream sequence, the nightmare sequence, which is very interesting. That um, Jill actually has this nightmare about Mark activating this trap and killing her as she hangs, because you know. Oh, I need to do a. Bad thing about well, no, the worst thing about killing you is I can only do it once. Uh, that's got to be a tagline for sure. That was good writing. There's a illusion, illusion, uh, that perception. Um, again, this movie was was supposed to be like, oof. There's all her guts innards anyway it's interesting how joe tuck had that dream when she doesn't even know that you know he has that scar around his face so that would probably show another inconsistency of um you know the timing of this movie here's our boy she- he was the lead singer of lincoln park I'll go back to Sean Patrick Flannery in a second. There were two more things I wanted to say about him. Which was which the other one was that he was also in the final season of Dexter, season eight. Uh, whereas Rita was um, another actress who played in Saw 5, was in Dexter seasons one through five. Uh, she was a main character for a while. So we have a, you know, a, couple main, a couple of Dexter actors that were in the Saw movies. All right. Um, and I think that's an El Camino. I think I don't know. I don't think so. Um, this is he was. This is the lead singer of. He was the lead singer of Lincoln Park. All these characters had to rehearse their lines, and they had to scream and do a lot, of, a lot of screaming in this scene. And they all hurt their lungs doing it, except for him. He was the only one that was fine. <laughs> 
But yes, rest in peace. Definitely rest in peace. He sadly died by suicide. Um, and yeah, he played um Evan in this movie. Um anyway, yeah. Um also, so I'm sorry, one second. I'm not gonna stumble over my words one second. Yeah, Chester um Bennington. Yes, uh, rest in peace, Chester Bennington. He passed away in 2017, which is strange. It feels like he, like, passed away, like, maybe two years ago. Maybe. Or maybe. Anyway, so, um, man, he has to rip his skin. Yeah, these were, like, skinheads, people who did some racist things and that was a symbolism of this of having to you know rip his skin off and her getting skinned and the dude hanging and everything um i do not remember so uh chester bennington um or not chester i guess uh, evan the character the woman that's at the bottom of the car she was the winner of this TV show called Scream Queens. She was the winner of Scream Queens season two. Apparently, that was the last season, also. Uh, this winner of season. Oh, that's how she got this role uh, to be under the car and get her her body cut up. She was the winner of Scream Queens. Screen Queen Season 2. The winner of Screen Queen Season 1 is actually this lady right here with the prosthetic hand who played um, Simone in Saw 6. And she cut her own arm off in order to survive. Uh, One second. Hmm. Yeah, see, and this is, that's real trauma. This woman, her abusive husband, abusive boyfriend, his name was Alex. Um, This, this was called the lawnmower trap. The lawnmower trap. Um, was very similar to the trap of the unproduced Saw 4 script with Jeff. Uh, Jeff, who had to go and find his daughter, actually uh, died in that similar way. In a, in a blender, a giant blender, in the original Saw 4 script. Uh, when he went to go find his daughter, he was actually being watched by another character. And by the end of it, that character had to choose if Jeff was able to live or not, was worthy enough of living. He's when we was watching the monitors and ultimately chose no. Uh, he didn't deserve it. And then Jeff was put through a blender. Andy kept parking at the mall. All right, so let me actually tell you guys who these people are in this group. Uh, you have this dude in like this brown checkered coat. He is a journalist. He's a cocky journalist, and he in real life, and he was he actually doesn't have. Uh, he was born without legs, um, so that wasn't like a digital effect or anything. He's actually physically handicapped. <laughs> so. <clears throat> We have Simone, the, the the woman who cut her own arm off. We have Malik. Um, he was the dude that had that was in had to put his hand inside the machine and and saw six and it um or saw five. I'm sorry, and it uh, split his arm apart. Dang it! Now that I watched Saw six and five back to back, in opposite order, my brain does not know the difference between the two anymore. 
Anyway, that was Malik. Emily was Emily was in the 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 carousel. She was a she was where she's wearing the pink. She was in the carousel. Um, Brad and Ryan were the two dudes who had to hold the saw in the middle of the park. Um, Tara was the mother in Saw Six, and she had to pull the lever on the insurance guy, William, and she said, I can't do it. And her son was like, I can, and he pulls the lever. Um, that was Tara. She was in the group. Um, Addie was um, the elderly lady. Um, William had to choose who to save, Addie or the other young gentleman. And um, whoever William saved, the bottom would like cave in and that char- and the other character would get hung. And the other guy got hung and Addie lived. She was the elderly woman. So she made it. Uh, Sydney was the woman who, the name of the woman who um, pushed her abusive boyfriend into the lawnmower. Um, the other, there's a, another woman here who has a closed eye. She was in Saw 5, and she was in the elevator. In Saw 5, right before Mark Hoffman gets kidnapped, he um, this is woman that comes out. She says, do you mind? Um, that was the woman um, who has her eye cut out in the group right here. And that was that same woman. So obviously Mark Hoffman was like, oh, you don't know, want to watch where you're going, huh? And then he takes one of her eyes. Um, there is one more person who is here, and his face is, I believe, um, he's wearing a cowboy hat, and um, yeah, he's just kind of there. Um, Daniel, I believe Daniel from Saw 2 was also supposed to be in here, but I think he was too old or something like that, and also because of the timelines, and I, I don't know, there was... Different issues, but Daniel from Saw 2 was again supposed to be here from what I, I believe. And um, the journalist from Saw 6 and 5, uh, the blonde journalist Pamela Jenkins was supposed to be here. And once again, uh, she was not. So, um, yeah, there's that useless information. Um, oof, they say what happened to him, you say they tell you not to smoke at the gas station, um, I wish I remembered this detective, anyway, um, yeah, so, the coroner that you just see in this scene, this coroner, he was, uh, no, 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 that's right, in Saw 4, that coroner, when he was dissecting Jigsaw's body, um, the hands that are actually dissecting the body was actually the prop, create the, the guy who makes, who makes the prosthetics and the, the props and all that, and the fake bodies, and the, you know, the fake props and stuff like that. Um, he was actually doing the actual dissection because the actor who plays that corner, who's been around since Saw 4 or, or 3, um, he doesn't have very steady hands and he can't actually steadily perform the procedure. So they had to use two different actors to actually do that scene uh, during the dissection scenes. But yeah, that corner has been around for a while and... You know, they're cutting off loose ends in this movie, so they're just like, yeah, let's go ahead and just kill him. Let's just kill everybody. Not leave any loose ends. <laughs> they were supposed to find Evan's body alive in this scene. There was actually a scene, I believe there is a line in here that suggested, hey, we found the dude was still alive, and um, or you have to come see this, or something like that. And the cop dude, right now, this detective dude, goes and they find Evan's body still alive. Um, Evan was, uh, Evan, the, the the lead singer of Linkin Park, he was supposed to come back for a future Saw movie. Basically, uh, Saw 8, um, 7.2, 7.2. Um, 
And, you know, uh, so anyway, they used, they wanted him to come back. But what ended up happening is when he filmed this scene, they didn't have enough time to film his body being alive. And he had to go on like a tour or something like that. And so the director was unable to get a hold of Chester um, in time. So because he couldn't get a hold of Chester in time, he had to take his flight and he had to leave and they couldn't film them finding Evan's body alive. So they were like, oh man. So they just said that he died, but really Evan was supposed to survive, which is, it's funny. The word survive just pops up. I do apologize for the hardcore fans who know about the symbolism of the word survive what it actually means what it actually represents i believe he as bobby goes through each wait when did he get kidnapped i I must have missed it somewhere i'm tired (laughs) i'm always doing these commentaries when i'm tired it's 11 o'clock at night so you know that's actually a reasonable time for me (laughs) to do these recordings anyway Losing track of... Oh, yeah, so they couldn't afford to... They couldn't film his body being alive. But, yeah, I remember watching this, that movie. I remember watching this movie in theaters, and then I saw... I saw his body fling into the the car, and I was like, huh, that didn't look very permadeath, you know, gruesome to me. I think he's all right. And then, yeah, it turns out, yeah, he was all right originally. And then, uh, yeah. You have one hour, Bobby. Do it. You want to fake being in one of my traps? I'm going to put you... I'm going to tell you what it's like to really be in a trap. So now we have the word survive. And the S in survive stands for... What you just saw. Which was, I think, start start your something. Start your... I can't read the bottom. I remember the directors were saying something about this scene, which was like, he, something about like, he could have like opened up the cage when he was away from the spike or something like that. Or, um, there was like an easy way to like get out of this situation and they just like, didn't think about it. All right, so I can talk a little bit about Sean Patrick Flannery right now. He was in the Boondock Saints. I actually met him. This dude is like the most honest, most open person that you would meet. This dude is... This dude is... um. He says the F word a lot. Like this dude, he cusses a lot. And it's just like natural. I don't think I've ever met anyone who cusses as much as this, as Sean Patrick Flannery. When I met him in, in person, it was funny because I always think about it. I'm always like, oh, and there's him in the bar meeting the dude. That sets him up with being a fake survivor. You know, so he just kind of has this idea that plants in his head. We can make money off being a victim and all that. And the idea just kind of possesses him to the point that he actually loses himself as a person and as a character. And he gets so lost in the lie that he just, it just consumes him so much. Mm. Jigsaw Survivor. Yeah, John. So yeah, Sean Patrick Flannery. He cusses a lot, but I always make the joke that you know I may have accidentally killed had killed him one day. Um, be I, I know it's weird to say that when I met him, I was actually sick. 
and I believe this was in late, no, it was January of 2020, right before everything happened, right before everything shut down, and the world changed, I ended up getting sick, I got sick in early 2019, and um, whether I got sick with whatever I got sick with, um, but it was pretty bad, and I did not want to miss my chance. Oh, there's the U in survive. Start your new, start a new or something. And the U is understand your problems. So now we, so in the word survivor, um, S stands for start a new. And U stands for understand your problems. Which I actually want to write that down. I wish I wrote that down and talked about it. So you see the weird lighting of this of this red line. That's another uh, you know thing about the three D cameras. Um, so I was sick with something very bad. I could barely talk, and when I met him, he offered me a handshake, and I tried to give him a handshake, and I told him that I was sick, and he he pulled his hand back, and he talked to me and everything. He was like, "Nope, don't want to get sick." But if I was really sick with something serious, and if we did do a handshake, and if he did get sick from me, and it was, you know, the bad, you know, sickness of that time, you know, and he actually got sick from me, and who knows if he would have got someone else sick, and they died, or if he died from it, or something like that, you know. Um, But I always make that joke like, Man, if that was ever on the news that, you know, Sean Patrick Flannery died from this sickness, that would be like the only one in the world who would have been like, yeah, he got that from me. I just ended up killing a big time actor by complete accident. Uh, but um, <clears throat> I don't know who this who this woman is who just gave the detective this. Dang. That was a big explosion. I think... I, I think... Okay, I could be wrong, but I think, if I remember correctly, that explosion that happened wasn't actually scripted. I believe something actually blew up, and those reactions that you saw, I believe those were all real. She was like, yeah, because I, I think... Yeah, from what I... Remember, the explosion was an accident, and it was just like, well. <laughs> Where to keep it in the movie? We have the symbolism now of this detective having, or this law enforcement individual having a connection with Mark Hoffman. Psychologically, what that represents is Hoffman breaking apart from law enforcement status and now we have this idea of killer versus cop and the idea of killer versus cop in Hoffman's mind happens now because he's detached from oh here's the R in survive what did that say it said redefine your problems I should write these down. Uh, so yeah, the symbolism of this cop is actually so symbolism of this cop is actually uh, symbolism of Mark Hoffman um, fighting the inner cop within himself and killing off the sense of righteousness within who he is. There is a lot of psycho. There's some some psychological. Um, reference or uh, symbolisms in the Saw movie. Not as hardcore as, you know, other series, but it's in here. This is probably the worst trap. The worst, in my opinion. One of the worst ones, which is she's like, this girl is strapped into the chair and he has to pull the key out of her throat and if she screams then it causes the, the metal wires the metal things to poke her neck 
This, I don't know why, that's like the worst one for me. Yeah, I have no, I have no notes for, for, for this Saw 7. So, I'm just going to write down, survive. Gosh, the sound effects are terrible. I remember being in the deep being, you know, sometimes you just watch a Saw movie and you're just like, how did I get here? What, what possessed me to just, you know, I could be at a park right now, I could be at a beach, but I'm here watching this. <laughs> I love what Charlie Clouser does with the music. Oof. Gosh, the blood. Gosh, that extra little shot of blood. The extra little shot of blood and just how Charlie Clouser plays the piano. He really knows how to bring an emotional. Oof. And as her skin gets stuck on her face for a second. A little dark comedy there. Yeah, at this point, you kind of think, yeah, I think everyone in this movie is going to die. Once she gets stabbed, it's like, yeah, I think they're just kind of. No. <laughs> you just need to shut up. <laughs> uh, everyone in the movie theater was loud, was cracking up at that scene. A lot of people were cracking up by the end of this movie. Um, and I was like happy, you know. It's funny that Chris Rock said when he did Saw 9, that he looked at Saw and he was like, this could have a little bit of humor in it. Or I want to make a Saw movie with humor in it. But it's funny because Saw 1, Saw 7, and Saw 5, 6 had humor in it. Well, they were pretty funny. Survive. My story of over overcoming Jigsaw. Bobby Deegan, survive. There's this woman, her shirt is digitally enhanced in pink. I really want to know who this, who this woman is. Like I said, I didn't do any research on this one. Name, sir? John. With an H without an H. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's unfortunate that... It's unfortunate that... um. Jigsaw, John, Dub and Bell had a whole story arc in this movie. And because the whole movie got cut, this is... This was like the only scene he had. Ah, okay. This woman always stood out to me. Uh, the woman that was wearing the pink robe. She always stood out to me in this movie. All the time. And I couldn't figure it out. I was like, 
But what is she? Who is she? She's important. She's significant. She means something. When you And also, I took a film class, and I learned about color schemes in movies. And when you do color schemes in movies and color enhancements, you understand that there are certain colors that represent something. This woman's colors and what she was wearing represented femininity and power within womanhood. And I always wondered why was her symbolism of feminine energy so powerful in the scene um she is actually the wife of a director of this movie so that would make sense why she was so digitally enhanced and why her colors were were the way that they were she's the direct she's the director's wife um yeah He's a, he's a jigsaw survivor. Do not enter. You know what? Um, I'm sure there's another one that's going to pop up. What are we on? We're on S, R, S, U, R, serve, so what, V? Verify your self-worth through. Okay, well, I'm just going to write down, verify your. Come on, don't stop working now. Verify your... Anyway. Hello, Bobby. That's just funny. How, bu how Billy just breaks through the wall in the cage. He's just like, hi. Yeah, this would, this movie really did show off the case that Billy's actually alive. He's actually a live puppet. He's secretly the one pulling the strings. Which, you know, they can't really talk about the paranormal in this movie, but there have been multiple times when Billy has done things where you could see him move certain shots that were seen when Billy was staring in one direction and then a different a different shot he was looking in a different direction. He's looking right and then he's looking left. I have I did no research on any of the traps of this movie or the names, so I do apologize for that. But traditionally I've done my research on all the traps and their names and a lot of the backgrounds. And um I look into all the characters' names. But I did not do that for this one. Um, I think I did that on purpose, actually, because I wanted to... <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. I wanted to actually enjoy... I wanted to actually enjoy this movie. Or, I'm sorry, enjoy this commentary. So I was like, you know what? Let me just kind of... Oh, snap. Okay, it's not redefine your problems. It is... Un or understand your problems. It's understand your... Wait. Oh, redefine... Re oh, um, start a new... Start your life anew. So the first one in survive is start your life anew. I know it's weird. I know. Sorry, I just know this woman's dying, so when she gets her eyes and mouth stabbed i'm just like i remember there there was something oof yeah, that's a bit much 
there was something about this scene. I don't remember what it was about. I think the pole, the pole was originally supposed to just go through her mouth. And then later on, they redid the scene and made this, the, the rods go through her mouth and her eyes. Because, you know, why not? Why not make it as gruesome as possible? Start, start your life anew. Understand your problems. Redefine your priorities. But always remember, but always, oh, I didn't even have the microphone up to my face. Wait, let me see. Hopefully, yep, uh, still fluctuating. Cool. <clears throat> but still, prior num safety is number one priority. You know, no matter how much you define, you define your priorities. <laughs> Uh, verify your self worth through commitment. Okay. Gibson, that's his name. Detective Agent Gibson. We'll go with that. Agent. If they did make a saw, um, you know, Final Chapter Part 2. This is really the last one. <laughs> I wonder what, what it would have been like. Like I said, this movie is a, is a combination footage of... Of, um... Of, uh, two movies. Ignore... What did that door say? Ignore your detractors? Oh, this scene right here. Um, I don't remember exactly what the scene, what this trap was originally supposed to be. But it was a little bit complicated than what it originally was. But also, this actor who... The actor who's actually doing this stunt, he really did this stunt. And he... He actually almost severely hurt himself because there was no safety. The way that this was like kind of structured was a little bit unsafe. And so they're high up right now. And <clears throat> and um when he had to jump from the from the the wall to the plank. Sorry, when he jumps to the plank, he um only had one shot to do that one scene. The camera was only there for that one shot. And when he jumped, he actually almost fell and he would have severely hurt himself. And luckily he made it during that jump. I like how, okay, so I did mention this, how from the very beginning of the Saw franchise, the tapes that say, play me, they're written in different inks. Some written in black and some are written in red. There's actually a difference between what they are. I sadly did not catch that difference. But from what I understand, the red play me tape seemed to be John. But um, the black ones seem to be some imposters or other characters. It could be other things, but that's just my hypothesis. Um, right here you see it written in black and you see... That the voice is very distorted, really meaning or representing that Jake's that John didn't actually make this trap, or perhaps he did. Perhaps he didn't record do the recording though. Well, he he couldn't have done the recording. You said it was a bottle. 
It was a battle. Calm down. This this movie is funny. This was one of the hardest. <clears throat> sorry, this is one of the hardest um, scenes to film in this small space with the 3D cameras. As you know. Anyway, sorry, I'm actually getting into the movie now. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I don't want to give too much of my own personal um, opinions and certain things. Oh, is he going to make it? Ooh, he didn't catch the key. 3D effect. And the key fell. Oh. Nope, and he gets yanked up. Oh, poor dude. Ignore your detractors. Ignore what, um... Ignore the things that diminish the importance or the value of something. You know, so if there's something that, um, is very valuable to you, or something that is valuable, you know, to something or somebody... You have to ignore the ignore those things that are um that diminish the uh the value of something. Learn to um ignore that. That's what I stands for in the survive. Um <clears throat> start anew when you start your life. When you start a new life or when you survive, um When you Ooh. Ouch. Dang. Hoffman shot this dude three times. Oh no, next time you shoot first. And you owe me, yeah, Jigsaw is a, or a, a boy Hoffman's a little manipulative, huh? Sorry, I know I'm like all over the place on this on this. I'm like all over the place on this recording. <laughs> Sorry, uh, what is that, loved ones? Pretty sure that was value your to value your loved ones. Oh, 
like talking to his wife. This this next part where um Bobby had to whip rip his tooth out. I believe that tra trap was been played around with since the second movie, and it was in five, and it was removed. But this whole idea of pull your teeth out to like find a code or get a key was something that's been around for a, a, a while. And I believe it was on one of the covers of Saw 2, maybe? I don't remember. If those sound effects are a bit much when it shows the teeth being pulled out. But yeah, this was an idea used that was kind of in the background. Multiple movies and it's finally was put. Yeah, V stands for value, value, value your loved one. Sorry, I forgot about that. So anyway, the first one, start your new, start your life. Start your life new. Um. Yeah, when you survive from a terrible situation. When you go have when you go through PTSD or something like that, you know something that's very terrible. You you have to lower, realize that you aren't going to. That's what it was. If he would have stayed in the cage, he could have. You could have. Um. The cops would have got there to rescue him, and he wouldn't have had to go through all this stuff at all. That's what the. The thing was the for the trap for for Bobby if he stayed in the cage. Um, yeah, when you go through something so horrible, you, you're not going to come back as the same person. You're definitely not going to come back as the same person as a uh, deep quote once said, you know, some situations are so impactful that they change your DNA. And it's very true and that we see that in genetic genetic bonding, uh, genetic memories. And when we have children or offspring, our offspring will have the same symptoms as we had as parents. <clears throat> and it's because some um, situations, some uh, situations are impactful that they actually change the way our DNA works. And so, yeah, when you have something traumatizing happen, um, you, um, yeah, you don't come back as the same person. So you have to start your life anew. You have to start life as a new version of yourself. That doesn't necessarily mean it's something bad. It can mean something good. It can mean... I survived something terrible, but now I have a new strength. So now that I have this new strength in me, I can actually go through life better with this new realization within me or this fear that I had inside of me, this hurt, this darkness that I had inside of me. I had to face it and it felt like facing death and I overcame it. But now, I feel free enough in myself to experience life in a new light, experience life in a new way. And you just start life anew. Understand your problems, understand where your problems come from, understand the nature of them, understand how they've affected you, understand where they come from, understand why they're there, understand the symptoms understand your problems in and out understand overstand and understand and just see how they work one of the best ways of healing is to honor and the best way to honor something is sometimes to just listen listen to what it has to say listen to what it needs just listen to it just listen listening is one of the best forms of honor honoring um re when you redefine your priorities when you redef you redefine what matters in life you have to understand that you can't just you can't just 
be the same person or do the same things that you've always been doing. It doesn't quite work that way. You need to have priorities in life because once you survive the situation and you do go past that threshold, you have to understand that what matters in life needs to be cherished, needs to be understood, it needs to be focused on because your energy and who you are needs to escalate or it'll de-escalate. It has to move forward or it's going to get dark. Embrace every day as if it is your last. That is the E in survive. Oh, I missed the other V. Oh, well. <clears throat> anyway, so, um, yeah, you know, focus on your priorities and just redefine what matters in your life and really make those the priorities. And once you have survived a traumatic situation, you understand the ability to manifest a better future for yourself or to manifest a future for yourself actually becomes a lot easier. Even if, even if you um, go through something, you know, bad, sometimes that pain can end up manifesting or attracting people that physically reinforce that pain or form or affirm that pain over and over again you may attract the same people bad people circumstances abusive people things like that you end up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy as some psychologists call it um, when you focus on when you start to really redefine your priorities you have to learn that once you go through trauma that everything that you feel, everything that you think, it manifests in your life a lot stronger and a lot easier. It's something that happens with everybody, but once you go through trauma, you unlock a superpower that is that can go one way or the other on the spectrum. It can be very light and lightning, but it could also be very traumatizing. For most people, it's it's what well, I want to say traumatizing. It's, it can become very enlightening or it can keep you in a state of pain and trauma, which can lead to other destructive things in one's life. <clears throat> this isn't my Dexter season two review, so I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> um, yeah, redefine your priorities. Um, verify your self-worth through commitment. Basically what I just said. Understand that you are worthy of life, of love, of good things. That's something that you have to find. You have to look into your life and you have to find what your self-worth is. You have to find what can you do for yourself? What can you do for your loved ones around you? What can you do for the world? What can you do? When you love something or care deeply for it, your will becomes a lot more powerful. And our lives strongly manifest around the things that we love, whether it's the people that we love, whether it's children, whether it's a job that we, whether it's a job that we really, really love, we put our all into it, a job that we're, we're the first ones there and we're the last ones to leave every single day, you know, a job like that, or you can... Or you can um, take something and when you put your full commitment into it, you can evolutionize it. Like what Quentin Tarantino does with his movies. He has a full dedication and full commitment to the craft and what he does. And through that commitment, through his vision, through that commitment of so many other variations of who he is and, and how he wants to express that and show that to the world... He's able to do that and, and, phys and physically manifest it through his commitment. So definitely understand that when you value, uh, definitely verify your self-worth by, um, you know, the things in your life that you commit to, whether it's love, whether it's 
I have this cool book that I, I like to write, but I want to see how far I can go with it. I have a family. I want to see how much I can push my family. How much can I teach this child to love in the world? How much can I provide for this person? And here's Hoffman killing everybody. Here's a Hoffman killing the coroner. Here's Hoffman being the Terminator for a while. I'm just murdering people. <laughs> That's how you verify your self-worth. Um, and yeah, ignore your um, detractors. Ignore ignore the things that devalue. You know, if, if there's someone who's... If you see the value in something and you said, you know what, this person is amazing. This person is great. And you have another person who's like, no, this person sucks. And it makes you feel like, oh, man. Oh, man, maybe this person isn't that great, you know. Or if you have a dream or a goal and you're trying to pursue that goal or commit to that goal. And someone's like, you know what, it's stupid. It's not that serious. And it's like, oh, man. You know, you have to just ignore that that detractor. Ignore. If you see something amazing and valuable in something, then your whole heart is in it. So if you have somebody or a naysayer, someone naysayer, first time I've ever used that word. I've heard it my whole life. But if you hear somebody or a hater saying, no, it's not that serious, then it's going to discourage you. So that's why in life, Oof, it's sticking the hooks in his body now. So that's why in life, you, um, oh, here's Hoffman killing more people. Anyway, so that's why you, um, don't listen to people when they, you know, look down at a dream or, or when you have a dream, that's why you don't talk too much about what it is you're going through and, when you are manifesting something great for yourself or creating something great for yourself or for your future, you have to be very careful about who you share that with because they can bring some negativity into it. You don't want that energy involved in the art of creation or manifestation because then you get the Reese's pieces, you know, you get that, Oh, one small ingredient got mixed in this ingredient and it creates a whole new thing now, and it can uh, take away from what you intentionally wanted to do or create. Value your loved ones, yeah. Value the people that you care about. I'll, I'll tell. I'll give a personal. I'll, I'm going to give a quick personal thing. I know that when I'm alive right now, I think about when I die. If I die. And I'm just like, you know what would really make life worth living? The people around me who I love. The people around me who I care about. Every day I spend with them. Every day I spend with them. I feel good about being alive. And the better I feel about being alive, the more at peace I am with the idea of dying. <clears throat> something I can't really fully explain right now, but I feel like the more love I feel, the more time I spend with everyone I care about and love, the more I feel more at peace with the idea of dying. And um, I think that's okay. So I do feel like one day I'll find someone to love. And as I fall in love with her, um, I'll say, hey, my heart is open. I'm at peace. I'm at peace in my life. As long as I'm at peace in my life, I can be at peace in my death. And now here's John, or Mark Hoffman. Shoots the detective in the eye. A reference to eyes being gouged out like in Saw 2. I was so happy when Jill stabbed him in the neck. 
and got away. I was like, run, Jill, get out of there. I don't want her to die. I love Jill. I didn't want her to die. She shouldn't have gotten involved in the game. Come on, Bobby, you're almost there. I think Bobby was supposed to put the hooks deeper into his, like, his chest cavity. And he kind of did it in his udder. And I think that's why it tore the skin. Because he didn't secure it enough. Embrace every day as if it's your life. Yeah, just uh, have fun with life. A lot of times people say, oh, you never know when you're going to die. So you got, oof. Yeah, so Bobby, the, the, the hooks tore Bobby's chest and he falls on the floor. Uh, again, this his story was supposed to continue and for a whole nother Saw movie. So that's why he kind of just lays there. Because it's like, whatever happened to Bobby? He was supposed to... Oh, is it recording? Yeah. He was supposed to be in a whole new, a whole other movie. <clears throat> hey, there's the gears from a different Saw movie. There's some traps in the background. Oh, poor Jill. She looks so scared. I, I, wish, they, I wish they didn't kill her off. I really wanted the idea of the better part of John. Ouch, that was a hard kick. I really wanted um her to be to be alive. It's to show that the best of John John Kramer was still alive in the world. You know, the best of who he was, the best of his legacy. But it seems like didn't quite work out that well. And when you see Bobby losing his wife Joyce. And in a horrific way. This giant pig. Um, furnace right here. Was actually, was actually a real torture device. That was used back in the day. The torture device. People were put in like a hot iron. Whatever. And container. And. They set fire to the container, and the people would just burn in there. It would just be dry, and it, the heat would just build up, and people would burn, and they would be surrounded by metal, so the metal would just heat up, and these people would just be burning in every which direction, no matter what they did, no matter what direction they turned, no matter what they touched, it was just burning them. And slowly, the air would get hotter, and they would just slowly very slowly burn and die. It was a real torture device that was used back in the day. Anyway, sorry. You see this back and forth of Bobby losing his wife at the same time Jigsaw loses his wife. You know, Jigsaw losing... Oh, poor Joyce. You see this as a consequence of... There's this, the OG head trap. And he uses the OG head trap on Jill. And you really do see this, this poor, you know, of innocent lover being, you know, killed or facing the consequences of you know, them being innocent and going through something so horrible. And then here's Jill thinking about John. And yeah, she's strapped. You know, helpless, can't really do anything. She's thinking about Gideon and her life. And she sees Mark Hoffman and Oof. Aw, oh, poor Jill. I wish they didn't kill her off. The 
there's Hoffman saying game over. As the final zap plays. But yeah, um, the horror that, you know, Bobby, Bobby's emb embodying, uh, the, the horror that Bobby is, is, is going through right now, living the nightmare of like Jigsaw you know, on the other side, you know. Now you see Billy the puppet right here, and you see Billy, he's just kind of sitting there looking at Hoffman like, bruh. You just killed Jill. Just know that you're not going to get away with it. Like, you know, I got you. I got your number. You, know, you can do whatever you want to, but understand that John was my boy, and I am going to come back to get you. That's what Billy's saying right now. Definitely value your loved ones. Boom. So right here we got the pig masks. Who are these three people in the pig mask that just jump Hoffman like that? The f the two dudes that actually grabbed him are... Uh, oh, it's... It's Lawrence Gordon. It's Dr. Gordon. Oh, man, that letter that Jill Tuck dropped off in that door. That was hot. That was Gordon's. Um, the two dudes, um, the, the three, the th 30 pig mask people who got Hoffman at the end of the movie was Lawrence Gordon, and the other two were the guys who were holding the buzzsaw at the beginning of this movie. Those are the other two accomplices of Jigsaw. In case anyone wants to know who those two accomplices were. We see how Gordon helped John out throughout all the movies. And putting putting Michael from Saw 2, putting the, the key in his eye. Jeff's wife, Lynn, from Saw 3, doing the brain surgery. He's so diabolical. Oh, there's the guy from Saw 4 who was blinded. And okay, they're showing the flashbacks. So I guess I know who you are. Ah, so it was Lawrence Gordon or Gordon, Dr. Gordon, who wrote I Know Who You Are in Saw, in Saw 6, who wrote that letter. This whole time I thought, I don't know who it was. Oh, watch over. Ooh, we're back in the bathroom. Right there. Yeah. yeah, we go back to the first room. The bathroom from the first Saw movie carries so much weight to it. Oh, and there's Adam's body. There's Dr. Gordon. He goes straight for the Saw. He's like, no, give me the Saw. He's like, nope. Me, 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 me. I don't think so. Yeah, a lot of people. Oh, well, his him throwing the saw down the hallway was actually Carrie Elwes's idea to do that. That was unscripted. So the E in survive means embrace every day as if it's your last. A lot of people say, "Hey, you know, you never know when it's your last day, so you better be grateful." Um. That's one way to look at it, more of a negative way of looking at it. But another way of looking at it is embrace every day as if it's your last, as in just have fun and be free and just be just be free and be at peace with uh with whatever's going on in the moment and whatever happens next.
Directed by Kevin Grutert. It sucks that this is the end of... Yeah, but we're all waiting. Everyone's still waiting for the continuation of this. Hopefully, um, we get there in Saw 11, which is coming out next year. It sucks. I was hoping to see that in for the 20-year anniversary. Same thing happened with uh, Fast and the Furious. Fast and Furious had their 20-year anniversary. And it was like a, they had like a year delay and the 20 year anniversary to celebrate the craziness of Fast and Furious was Fast and Furious 9. But anyway, um, yeah, so we lock away Hoffman and we, yeah, we lock away the corruption of Jig, of the entity of Jigsaw and Hoffman really represents that corruption, the corruption of Jigsaw is really seen strong in Hoffman's character, but also in Cecile's character in Saw X. So those two characters being left behind really signifies the fact that the psychotic, sadistic part of who Jigsaw is, possibly John Kramer is, it hasn't been fully explored, and it hasn't been... It hasn't had a conclusion yet. Um, I'm trying to think of what's that word? Not conclusion, but you know, I guess conclusion. It hasn't as it hasn't had that yet. That so because it hasn't had that, you know, that closing, it's kind of like locked away and left in the darkness right now. But that psychotic side of uh, Jigsaw has yet to be fully explored and have its, you know, have its, uh, okay, so that random gap that was in Saw 5, it's not in, 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 it's not, that wasn't normal in end credits, so I wasn't going crazy. And yeah, no, it's not conclusion. The end credits are rolling, I don't have time to, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Too bad we couldn't see what happened with with our boy Bobby. But yeah, Bobby is embodying f- true trauma now. And really embodies the trauma of Jigsaw, of John. But yeah. <clears throat> so can't wait to explore that side. So now we have Lawrence Gordon who actually represents... The, the the kindness of J- of John the right I don't want to say righteousness but the kind heartedness of who Jigsaw is of what Jigsaw is as an entity and um we do see that the kindness of Jigsaw's legacy is what does continue to live on and not the crazy psychotic sadisticness of uh, jigsaw's legacy closure that's the word i'm looking for closure not conclusion closure so yeah um i'm not sure if i actually explained that in saw x why um cecile is her name cecile yeah her cecilia because it was like cecil from saw 4 um yeah, those characters, uh, Cecilia, Cecilia, and um, Hoffman represent the sadistic nature of who Jigsaw is. So, um, anyway, okay, Anguistics, the Inquisitions is Etta Cohen. I can't believe I just caught that name randomly. Etta Cohen actually had a character named after her. In Saw 5 or 6. And it was 5. Because that was, was, was with uh, Peter. But one of the detectives in the background with the glasses was named after Etta Cohen. And it just said that Etta Cohen was involved in anguistics. Whatever that is. Anyway, this was a great franchise. This was a great movie. I loved seeing the bathroom at the end of this movie. And I loved exploring that idea of returning to the bathroom what the bathroom symbolizes and just making it go full circle and ending the way that it did. Can't wait for Saw 11, Saw 3D. Hope you enjoyed this commentary. You guys have a great night.